The uh, temperance movement really began in the 1830s and really picked up in the 1840s. And it was very much a Protestant-based movement, but certain Catholics certainly did join in. It is interesting, though, to note that prior to the 1830s, before there really was much of a temperance movement at all, when the early Irish were in Lowell, um, drinking was actually much more open and not so much frowned upon. In fact, Kirk Boot was the engineer for the mills and boarding houses and canals. He himself was quite a drinker. And in fact, one of the other things that's not often talked about that was constructed early was a brewery in which Boot was not only uh, the purveyor, but also a, an investor in this brewery. Um, he was very close to the Catholic community, Irish Catholic community in Lowell. In fact, on St. Patrick's Day, they often toasted to Kirk Boot, which would seem kind of odd for Kirk Boot being such an Anglophile, and yet he was really liked by many of the Irish in Lowell. But the temperance movement really does uh, change things quite a bit, and it coincides really with the arrival of the second great wave of Irish immigrants, which associated with the great hunger in Ireland. And that's when you really begin to see the Irish very much dominating the liquor trade in Lowell. There was an Irish priest named Father Theobald Matthew. He made his way through Ireland and across the U.S. giving this temperance pledge. We actually have one of the coins that Father Matthew gave out. And he would give this coin to these Irishmen who would swear that they would never have another drink again. Father McDermott was the pastor at the time, and he was a leader. One account said that 10,000 men and women took the pledge on the front steps of the church here on one of Father Theobald's visits. Well, it might seem a little sacrilegious to talk about the rise of the American party in the 1850s in St. Patrick's Church, because much of, uh, certainly some of the members of the American party directed their reforms uh, against Irish Catholics. And um, so, but what's interesting about the American party is that it emerged almost out of nowhere. Um, in 1850, uh, before 1854, there were basically two political parties uh, nationally, uh, in, within the state and uh, locally in Lowell, and that was the Democratic and the Whig parties. And these two parties really were vying for power for a generation or more until the 1850s when really the issue of slavery emerged and splintered the Whig party apart. And there were also a number of other uh, issues that were coming to the fore at that time. One related to this great wave of immigrants coming into the United States, really after, in the 1840s, with the great hunger in Ireland, as I mentioned, but also with the failed revolutions in Europe. And so you had, again, large numbers of, of in Lowell, it was especially Irish, coming in in the 1840s. And there was great concern about whether or not these Irish Catholics could be assimilated and become part of America. Um, and so this party is formed, known as the Know Nothing Party, because it was almost a lodge-like group. But they do form, in fact, a party that becomes national in its uh, scope. In Massachusetts, it was especially strong. The Know Nothing Party in 1854 swept offices. Seven of 11 congressional districts became uh, American Party. Uh, members. The legislature becomes do dominantly American party. The mayor of Lowell is a know-nothing. Um, so they become really quite powerful. They have a number of legislative reform proposals, one of which is to restrict immigration. One way of doing that is by essentially creating the naturalization period from seven years, which it existed, to 21 years. So before you could vote, as an immigrant, you had to reside in the United States and swear the oath after 21 years of living here. The other thing that came out of the American Party in Massachusetts was an investigation. And if you look at the legislation behind this investigating committee that was to go around to churches and convents and to basically find out what were the Irish Catholics doing. Um, it was led by an American Party member, Joseph Hiss, a tailor from Springfield, and Hiss and his small group of men visited churches in Roxbury, they uh, visited a church out in Worcester, and they came to Lowell. And when they were in Lowell, essentially all hell broke loose. So let's back up a little bit. The Irish that were here, as Grace said, after Ungata War, the Great Famine, the worst year was 1847. 
And that was when there were most deaths in Ireland. But that also led to that great wave of immigration here to the U.S. and to Lowell. So we have all these people arriving without jobs or uh, bringing disease was thought. A uh, ship's fever is listed as the cause of death all over. The priests that were here, the O'Briens, had a concern that education was so important. They brought in a group of nuns, the Sisters of Notre Dame de, de Namur. They were French order, but didn't matter. They were the nuns that would take the job of educating the Irish girls. So right here, the school is still open today. They opened an academy for the children of the area. The Smelling Committee, that's what they call themselves, the Know-Nothings. The Smelling Committee came to sniff out what was really going on in that academy. They came to the doors of the convent, banging, demanding to be entered. They made several visits. Finally, they said they weren't leaving until they got inside the convent. The priest was called and he said, fine, I'll show you. He came inside and the, the men of the smelling committee were going through the drawers of the sisters. Imagine these women were semi-closed, cloistered. It was 19th century. This was traumatic for them. They even went into the infirmary, into the sick nun's bed, and looked underneath the cushions. There's an account of one man blowing cigar smoke through the convent. Now, we get to Joseph Hiss that you mentioned. Joseph Hiss, who was part of the spelling committee, also brought a female friend of his along. And when that was found out, that the state was paying for these fees, and correct me if I'm wrong, that was his grace at the beginning of the end of the Know Nothings. And the reason we know so much about the Hiss Committee, in fact, that he was pretty well a disgrace, even among members of the American Party, and there were hearings held in the legislature to find out what, what exactly was Hiss doing with state funds. And in fact, Hiss was expelled from the legislature. And even though I should think it's important to point out that none of the uh, legislation that was to restrict immigration ever passed. In fact, the American Party was a fairly progressive in terms of promoting uh, in passing legislation for, for example, school reform. They established the first compulsory school law in the United States. They improved pay for teachers. They eliminated the mechanics lien law that basically uh, removed the encumbrance of, of debt from mechanics who were not responsible for the money that Gray, they were Gray, you and I have this debate every year. You're right. They did do some good, but they were also haters. And they were. Yes, and they are. They exist today, David. We yes, can find that do. today. But yes. uh, anyway, so I think the, the legacy of the American Party, which was very short lived, by the way, the Republican Party is coming around at the same time and eventually succeeds the American Party. There were many anti immigration types who, in fact, were also involved with the Republican Party. So it was really only a couple of years when the American Party was uh, really at its peak.